all change at Twitter. First it was the ownership, now it's the brand with the website's bird icon making way for a simple X. But is it that simple? And why the change? What's behind owner Elon Musk's move? And what will users make of it? This is Inside Story. Welcome to the program. I'm Adrian Finnegan. He bought Twitter for $44 billion. So perhaps it shouldn't be unexpected that Elon Musk wants to leave his mark on the social media website. But the announcement that a simple X will replace the iconic bird logo surprised millions of Twitter users as well as investors and the marketing world. His takeover of the website has been turbulent to say the least with mass layoffs of staff concerns over how content is moderated and criticism of changes to the social media platform so what's behind the branding transformation how will it go down and what's musk hoping to gain from it we'll be asking these questions and more with our guests in just a few moments but first a report from salah Haidat. It's no secret that the world's richest man has ambitious plans for one of the world's most used social media platforms and in true Elon Musk style, he told his followers on Saturday that they too could become part of his new vision for Twitter. Then on Sunday, his Twitter profile changed. The blue bird logo was out and in with a new black and white X. The rebranding beamed onto Twitter headquarters in the US. And the logo change Musk has said is part of his Twitter vision to use the app for multiple purposes, including audio, video chatting and payments. He's referred to it as the Everything app, or powered by artificial intelligence, pushing it closer to Asia's so-called super apps. WeChat in China, which is one of the region's biggest platforms, is used as a one-stop app for millions of users' daily needs, well beyond just short messaging. Elon Musk bought Twitter last year for $44 billion. Turmoil followed after he fired half of the workforce. Since his takeover, the company has lost half of its advertising revenue. Other changes have included charging users for previously free services, such as the blue verification tick. The signature bird sign was created in 2006 when Twitter was founded with short messages called tweets, just as birds communicate by chirping. Musk faces new competition from an old adversary. Mark Zuckerberg's Meta, owner of Facebook, launched a rival platform called Threads earlier this month. But Elon Musk's fascination with the letter X goes beyond his business ventures, naming his son two years ago X. Whether X becomes a mark of success or not, it will define Musk's latest venture. And whatever happens, a master of self-publicity is keeping him in the news. Sarah Khairat for Inside Story. All right, let's bring in our guests. From London, we're joined by James Greenfield, the founder and chief executive of the multinational brand agency Koto Studio. In Dublin, in Ireland, Elaine Burke. She's a science and technology journalist and host of the podcast For Tech's Sake. And also in London, Alison Stewart Allen. Chief Executive of International Marketing Partners, which specializes in branding and marketing expertise. A warm welcome to you all. James, let's start with you. Elon Musk has long envisioned a super app along the lines of China's WeChat that will do everything from online banking to shopping and video messaging. Twitter CEO Linda Yaccarino tweeted on Sunday that X will be the platform that can deliver, well, everything, she said, but is getting rid of the bird logo a good idea. It is the platform's most recognisable asset, isn't it? Yeah, it totally is. And I think it's in, you know, there's been a lot of people that have muted the want for a super app in the West for a while now. Um, I think the challenge is if you're starting with something like Twitter, which has had a pretty controversial uh, recent past, um, to then think that you're going to kind of get rid of all of that by changing a bird to an X, and, and the rest is going to be plain sailing, then I think they might have underestimated the challenge that they have at hand, uh, particularly where there is a lot of other places and spaces where people can spend their time at the moment. How can someone like Elon Musk underestimate? Do you, do you think, I mean, he's, a, he's a, a savvy businessman, isn't he? I mean, you look at SpaceX and Tesla. How can he get it, be getting it so wrong with Twitter? 
Well, I think there's a difference between products and brand and marketing. And I think that's one of the things that a lot of people in the tech industry maybe underestimate sometimes, which, you know, you can make a very compelling product. You know, there's no doubt that Tesla has moved the world of EVs forward in a pretty amazing way. But that doesn't mean that necessarily that Tesla is a great brand. At the moment, what's really working in Tesla's case is you've got this product that feels very different. It, it's kind of ahead of all the competition. It's delivered, uh, you know, something that's very visible. And, and all of the controversy and all the things that he says just uh, deliver kind of great marketing for it because ultimately what it's doing is making people notice it. I think but product will only get you so far because after a while, what you need to do is you need to break into those groups that aren't necessarily interested in product or aren't necessarily interested in Elon as a, as a character. And so I think any brand has to go on this journey through those early adopters into that mass market position. Um, and I think that's where you really need brand and marketing to do a lot of the heavy lifting for you. Elaine, what do you make of the rebrand uh, and Elon Musk's plans for a super app? Yeah, it's not a new concept from Elon Musk. Even before he mooted the idea of buying Twitter, he had uh, put forward this idea of a super app X, the everything app. He already had the name in mind. And he had talked about it being some sort of a spin out of Twitter or bundling in Twitter. And again, this was even before he was uh, bullied into buying the platform. Um, but it, it was something that we've seen expected on the cards. Uh, X seems to be a brand that he himself is quite uh, keen on SpaceX being the name of his uh, space technology company. Um, and, and it has been rolled out kind of, again, like a lot of things happening with Twitter, late night announcements on a weekend, and then suddenly all things are uh, moving at a fast pace of a Monday. So what we're seeing today is the X logo being rolled out on the platform. Uh, it's on Elon Musk's own page. The at Twitter account is now an X logo, but it's still called at Twitter. And the buttons on the site still say tweet. And uh, that, that's something that's really strong in the Twitter branding. Like they actually created a whole language around social media and, uh, you know, what was once called microblogging is simply referred to now as tweets. And I think to step away from that is a bit of a mistake. And it, it does seem to be a bit of Elon Musk making a brand in his image. And is his image that attractive for people to follow along as well? Yeah, he says tweets are going to be rebranded as X's. Does that mean we'll all be Xing instead of tweeting in the future? This is this is silly, isn't it? Well, I, I find uh, with Irish people in particular, that will be a really hard move to make because we are known to kind of stick our guns whenever a brand takes over a venue, we'll still call it by the old name. And uh, and some things just stick as well. Like in Ireland, and I think in the UK as well, we call everything that's a vacuum cleaner a hoover. So some brands are very powerful and take over an entire category no matter who tries to take over that space as well. So changing people's language isn't as easy as he may think it is. And again, he's just giving people constant opportunities to walk away from a platform that they've been threatening to walk away from for quite some time now. Alison, what damage has Musk done to the Twitter brand? I mean, not just with this, with the, the, with the X rebranding, but since he, he um, took, owner, uh, took ownership of it. Uh, and to what extent will, will that damage, if indeed you think he has done, I, I'm anticipating what you're going to say here, uh, but uh, what extent is that going to spill over into, into his other brands and impact things like Tesla and, and SpaceX? And, of course, his own reputation as a businessman. Yeah. Well, what a really great question. I mean, of course, um, he is a brand, Mr. Musk. Uh, of course, we all know what he stands for. Or we think we do, uh, whether it's the cars or the space exploration, as you say, or this social media platform. Uh, and I think one idea is that perhaps this little X as a rebrand is an experiment. Uh, he's renowned for doing small experiments. Uh, it could well be he's gauging all of our reactions to this rebrand. And X weeks from now, pardon the pun, it'll go back to being called Twitter again. Uh, so uh, my hunch is this may not be a permanent brand change, uh, that he's just trying to see how we respond. In terms of the bleed into his other businesses, uh, you know, his he is the other businesses, which is really quite a problem. You know, whenever you have a key person uh, who has their imprint all over all these companies, uh, one risk, therefore, is that you associate the companies squarely with the personality uh, of the founder or of the owner. Uh, and that's hugely risky. Uh, we see this all the time in, for example, 
you know, using celebrities as endorsers. They then go rogue. They do crazy things uh, that then, uh, you know, causes problems to the brand. All I need to say is Kanye West and Adidas. So it could well be that, you know, someone uh, speaks up and says, look, Elon, you need to go in the back seat uh, and let the people that you've appointed drive these businesses the way you've asked them to, uh, which really would minimize the risk. So, I mean, there's a lot of variables okay. here that are going to determine the long term future of not only X, formerly known as Twitter, mm. uh, but all of his other businesses, too. But, Alison, I mean, he's already eroded trust in, in the Twitter brand by removing blue ticks, making users pay for them, firing thousands of staff, restricting the number of tweets that users can see in their feeds, reinstating controversial accounts. I mean, how much more damage can this man done? I, 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 do you think we're witnessing the death, death throes of Twitter, or is it, is it too early for that? Uh, well, I think if you survey advertisers uh, who are definitely looking at reallocating their budget uh, away now from Twitter because of all of this tumult, uh, I do wonder whether his ambition of making this an all-encompassing application where, you know, you can, it's e-commerce, you can buy from it, you can use it for social purposes and all sorts of other reasons, you know, at the end of the day, um, the business model is at the, its heart around the advertisers. And if the advertisers are leaving because users are leaving, which is usually how it works, uh, then the advertiser will go somewhere else. And, you know, as Elaine just was saying earlier, um, there's choice now. You know, you can go to Threads or you can go to Instagram or any of other meta platforms or LinkedIn, depending who your target audience is. So it isn't that, you know, these advertisers don't have options. They do have lots of options. And if they leave, then Mr. Musk's business model will have to be reinvented somehow or other. I'm not sure how. James, uh, to what extent has, has Musk thrown a golden nugget here to Mark Zuckerberg and Meta just days after it launched its, its Twitter rival Threads. I mean, if you were uh, advertising, uh, if you were advising, rather, uh, Musk as, as a client right now, what would you be telling him about his brand? Uh, I'd be telling him to calm down on the instability. I think, you know, there's one thing being a kind of product guy and putting stuff out there and trying stuff and, you know, to, to build on the points we've just heard, like the, the way that he can be quite... Um, I guess, responsive to this kind of stuff. But I think what I'd be saying to him is you've got to be careful with your brand. Your brand is something that's incredibly precious to you. It, you know, they take a long time to build and they can be destroyed very quickly, uh, as uh, we were talking about with uh, Kanye West and Adidas a minute ago. But I think, you know, in this case here, what he needs to understand is that people only have an appetite so much for instability. And actually, one of the most important things that you can be as a brand is consistent. Now, that's not to say you need to be boring and you need to kind of like be metronomic in stuff, but you do need to be consistent. People need to trust you. And whether that's an advertiser or a user, uh, particularly if he's going to then move it into the financial space where he's thinking about this as a payments app, I think there's no part of our world as a consumer where we want to have trust and security more than with our money. And so, therefore, I think the idea of everyone suddenly jumping onto X and using it to pay each other when there's a myriad of different other options available out there already for that seems quite unlikely to me at the moment. So my, my suggestion would be, if you're going to go about a rebrand, do it carefully, do it kind of constructed, really think about all the outcomes. I think what the moment the problem is, we've got a bit of a Frankenstein product in market where different names in different places, as Elaine said a minute ago, uh, and that's just going to erode trust. And once you've eroded it, it's really hard to win it back. Yeah, I, I want to come back to something that you were saying there a, a few moments ago about... about um... Uh, people doing everything on, on, on X and whether they trust the, the brand. Uh, we'll come back to that. But first, um, uh, Elaine, uh, do Twitter users actually care what the platform is called, as long as they can still use it much as they always have done? Um, and and will, will they, do you think, still engage with the platform if it does more than just microblogging? Well, see, that's the thing that James was kind of hinting at there, is that uh, this is kind of the end of Twitter as we know it possibly because this this X everything app isn't going to be about microblogging. Uh, it does seem that he's going to try and build a super app. Now, I do think that that is misguided because the successful super apps that exist are in 
China, where you have a, a tech walled garden, they don't have access to things like Twitter or Facebook or Instagram or anything like that. So WeChat has been able to grow and expand in that environment. In other uh, areas where super apps have been successful, it tends to be in economies where people don't have um, as much access to bank accounts. There's like a, a high level of unbanked people. And a lot of these apps are tied to payments, as James referred to, and, and micropayments and that kind of thing. You need to have a high, high level of trust for people to start uh, doing their finances through your app. Uh, that hasn't really been uh, the case with Twitter under Elon Musk, that trust uh, and transparency has been at a high level. And uh, he's not going to be driving this in an environment like he seems to be targeting your, your US and your EU markets with his services. And we tend to have a high proliferation of people with bank accounts and other finance options. So it's just, it's hard for me to see uh, what opportunities he will be able to unlock here uh, where others ha haven't tried or haven't unlocked those things in European or US markets. I don't have confidence that Elon Musk is the person to do that. I do think he believes he can. But on his journey to do that, I don't see Twitter remaining the platform that it was before his purchase of it. And it will become something very different as he tries new things and possibly fails at them. OK. And is, is that, that, that a gap that threads will, will fill? I do think that, yeah, you kind of mentioned it. Is this like a golden opportunity for Mark Zuckerberg? Again, the rushed nature of X's branding coming out today could be a symptom of playing catch up with the release of threads, which also seemed to be capitalizing on a bad moment for Twitter when they introduced the rate limit. And it, it seems to be that threads actually upped its release date because of that as well. So maybe there is in the background that competitive nature between the two companies where they're rushing things just to compete with one another. Um, but what that did for Threads was it saw a huge adoption very, very quickly. It's the fastest uh, service ever to reach 100 million users and signups. But activity hasn't seemed to match that appetite. I think there was a, a huge influx of people securing their name on a major platform, which is an important thing to do to secure your handle, uh, but not matched with the level of activity and engagement. So that's the challenge that Zuckerberg has to overcome here. And if Twitter keeps giving opportunities where it gets distracted with the purpose of the platform that most people use it for, of tweeting and sending tweets, um, I'm not going to call them X's, uh, then Zuckerberg has another moment here to capitalise on and, and maybe up that engagement rate. Alison, uh, here we are sort of hinting that, that Elon Musk is is slightly batty uh, perhaps, but I mean, what if what if this is what if this is genius? What if uh, X becomes a super a successful super app, or even a super successful super app? Uh, of course, advertisers are going to pay to be on it. That may be a long way down the road, or or, or is it? But uh, you know, it, it's going to make money in the end. And we'll all be sitting here when when X is is the platform that everybody is on, thinking, "Wow, this man is amazing." So the assumption behind your question is, in fact, that people will change their habits fundamentally and stop their purchases through other platforms, PayPal, uh, Etsy, Amazon. You know, these habits are really entrenched now. COVID has helped us hugely in determining how we buy online. So if we're going to change how we buy online, we need some good reasons. And unless we're incentivized to change those habits, we're not going to do that. So we're going to need to be educated, which costs a lot of money, by X, if that's the brand name that sticks, as to why there is value in changing our habits. Now, lots of governments Lots of platforms, lots of uh, e-commerce businesses have tried very hard to get us to change our consumer habits, uh, and they've spent a lot of money trying to do so, and it hasn't worked. So we haven't really yet been given the reason to buy, the reason to switch, and that takes energy. You know, we generally, once we've made a decision, we generally want to stick with it as consumers. We probably go to the same supermarket we've always gone to for decades. We probably still bank with the same bank we've always banked with similarly for decades. So if we're really going to switch, we need a good reason. And so far, 
that promise or that reason hasn't been presented to us. Now, maybe, as you suggest, there's a big surprise coming and it's going to be so compelling uh, that we're going to change the way we do things. But I'm not sure that Musk has the billions that it would take to get us to change those habits, unless he's going to give away free money. And if he's going to give away free money and say, come by uh, through us, use our e-com channel, uh, and we're going to give you tons of rebates and incentives so that it's worth your while, possibly. Mm. Is that in his plan? Is that how he tends to do things? Has he done that with Tesla, for example? No. So why would he start it here? So I'm not convinced that this is really the, the, gonna gonna pay off for him. James, a, a super app like the one that, that uh, uh, Musk is envisioning would be meta on steroids, wouldn't it, as far as data gathering uh, is concerned? I mean, what are, what are the ethics here? How concerned do you think consumers will be about handling all of their data to an app at a company that, that doesn't exactly have the best of, of reputations, thanks to its new owner right now? Yeah, I think that's a massive challenge. I think there's also the challenge with the fact that, that kind of our trust and our interest in technology is generally decreasing anyway. You know, there's the argument that's because, you know, social media, we're kind of 15 years, maybe even a little bit more, 20 years into it now. And people have realized that there's as many negative outcomes as there are positive outcomes to it. Uh, people are worried about the effect it has on our children people are worried about the effect it has on our uh, democracies upon politics upon you know a lot of things in, in our life and so i think we went through a period in the kind of late 2000s where it, it was all seen very kind of positively i think you know the the 2010s saw the, the death of that and in the 2020s i think we really find ourselves where people question how they spend their time as much as how they spend their money and so against all of that there is an argument that our data is precious and we should be careful about who we give it to I'm not sure the average consumer is as worried about their data as maybe people think they are, but I don't think they're necessarily inclined to have all their eggs in one basket, to have this one company deliver everything to them. You know, I think to build on Elaine's point, I think the reason those super apps have worked in other countries have been quite often uh, access to banking or have been cultural or have been that they've just managed to hit a zeitgeist where as technology flooded into these countries, uh, they, they kind of they rode the wave and added more and more and because people were there it worked already i think you know you can look at meta they've had some great successes you know instagram's a brilliant product that's done very well for them um, but they've also had some losses things like portal never really took off were allowing people to be able to connect i think you know they tried to go after our, our, our time at work with workplace that's never really kind of connected and so i think what we find, particularly in the US and, and maybe in Europe as well, is that we think there's a limit to how much we want a company to really dominate our uh, living and breathing uh, times. And I think, you know, if I look at a country like South Korea, where kind of mega corporations do everything from kind of agricultural through to social media, I think I'd find that hard to okay. believe that would happen in a country like the US. Let's, let's put that point to uh, Elaine. WeChat in China is ubiquitous. Musk himself says that, you know, people... Uh, more or less live on the platform. There are, of course, others elsewhere in the world. We've got Grab in Southeast Asia, m -Pesa and Temtem in Africa, Rappi in Latin America. Uh, why hasn't the US and, and Europe jumped onto a, a, a platform like the one that Musk is envisioning before now? It's not that no one else has had this ambition before now. That's absolutely not the case. But, uh, you know, there are antitrust uh, issues when it comes to monopolizing too many um, industries and verticals uh, and, and the US and EU laws would be quite uh, well probably not strict enough there but uh, they do attempt to try and control that and in the EU now we have the Digital Services Act coming down the line and that's specifically marking out legislation for very large online platforms and looking quite uh, specifically at how they control data across different services and maybe share data across different services so that will actually in create new hurdles for any company that has uh, the notion of trying to build a super app that functions in Europe uh, and does it in the way that they maybe hope to replicate the, what happens in Southeast Asian apps or in China. Um, but it, it, it is, I do think that those super apps are a symptom of the markets that they've launched in. And as James said, they have capitalized maybe on a moment. 
that has possibly passed at this point for the US and EU markets, the way people feel about conscious consumerism and thinking deeply about who they do business with, what companies they do business with, has really transformed the ability for any business to really take that kind of power and control over multiple services. Uh, it's just something I don't really see happening here. I think there's too much consciousness, too much regulation. Uh, it is something that I'd say plenty of companies would like to do because it's a huge market. Amazon is probably the company that comes closest to even being somewhere in that model in that it has a whole entertainment industry. It has a marketplace. But the marketplace stuff has been quite hard for social media platforms in the US and EU to, to land on. I mean, as one example, Facebook marketplace does exist but anecdotally, for, from what yeah. I'm told okay. and from my experiences on it, yep. it's not got a lot of trust in there. OK, okay. Alison, I, I saw you nodding on this issue of, of antitrust uh, regulations. I mean, what will regulators have to say about a platform that does everything that companies like Amazon, Meta, YouTube, Uber uh, and fintechs are already doing? Yeah, well, uh, I think rightly we want to protect consumers and give them choice. Uh, and if we keep them captive uh, and make it very hard for them to exit once they've entered our ecosystem, uh, then that is clearly problematic. You know, uh, lawmakers, certainly in the US and EU, to some degree the UK, uh, are pretty concerned not just with the what do we, how do we, uh, you know, break up these companies that are attending towards uh, monopoly. It's also about their monopoly on the data uh, and how they exploit the data for commercial purposes. You know, surveillance capitalism, a phrase only just coined a few years ago, is very real. Uh, and, you know, the reason these companies, you could say, are in business at all is because m they make more money on uh, analyzing and selling the insights from the data than they actually do from selling you any goods. And, you know, Musk is not uh, unaware of that. He's very uh, clear, I think, that uh, this is another revenue stream. Uh, and perhaps it will be the lifeblood uh, of X. Uh, but so far, it doesn't look like X has the critical mass of users uh, or advertisers to make that really pay off. So again, we're back to the what's the incentive and once we have an incentive, if you are okay. pulling in hundreds of people, then that's going to be scrutinized for sure. We're out of time. Many thanks indeed. James Greenfield, Elaine Burke and Alison Stewart-Allen for being with us. As always, thank you for watching. Don't forget you can see the programme again at any time by going to the website at aljazeera.com. For further discussion, join us on our Facebook page at facebook.com forward slash AJ Inside Story. And you can join the conversation on Twitter, or should we perhaps say X, you can X us at, at AJ Inside Story from me, Adrian Finnegan, and the whole team here. Thanks for being with us. See you again. Bye for now.